Welcome to JSA TV, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Barb Mitchell with JSA and joining me today, actually for the first time on JSA as part of JSA and, and actually part of our Data Cloud USA interview series is Josh Snowhorn, founder and CEO of Quantum Loophole. Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm excited to introduce you to our audience and, and to have you here and hear a little bit more about your business. Thank you for having me. So Josh, uh, Josh Snowhorn here is not only the founder and CEO of Quantum Loophole, but also known widely throughout the industry for founding Global Peering Forum and you know, a series of innovations, I think, that have, have led to you being a, a sought after speaker globally, not just uh, you know, at the upcoming Data Cloud USA event, but in all sorts of other places and times and occasions, which I'm sure you can tell us a little bit more about. Uh, and then on just a personal level, I understand that you're an avid snowboarder and surfer and all around adventurous. So lots for you to share with us personally and professionally. Um, but I'd love for you to start today by telling us a little bit about Quantum Loophole and the plans that you have for your gigawatt scale data center communities. Can you share with us a little bit about that? Of course, I would love to. Um, you know, Quantum Loophole was founded by uh, uh, myself and, and a team of incredible executives because it really takes a team to do what we're doing. Um, we, we really looked at the data center industry and the sectors building out large buildings and, and competing with each other either in either the hyperscalers themselves or the multi-tenant providers, public sector providers, enterprise providers, and recognize that there was a, a massive amount of infrastructure money chasing the same kind of uh, a gold, you know, golden pot at the end of the rainbow. What we realized is that all of those entities in the, in the industry need land, energy, water, and fiber optics. So we chose to play in what we call the elements of the data center business. But to do that, you can't just go buy a 50 acre parcel of land that doesn't fit the bill for what everybody needs. We really are changing the game in that we're building a, a master plan data center community. Our first campus is 2,164 acres. So it's the biggest data center campus in the world. It has entitlement and zoning of 1,500 acres of, of industrial land on the campus already. It was a former Alcoa aluminum smelter. So we're actually taking reclaimed brownfield land and converting it into the data center sector. It already had existing transmission power lines feeding it, had tons of fiber optics uh, systems already around it from Zeo and Lumen and Verizon, and at and Comcast, and so on and so forth. And, and, then, and then it had a massive amount of water adjacent to it, in particular, 7 million gallons of gray water, which is treated sewage water that goes in the Potomac River every day. So uh, all those factors were tr a great benefit, but the real kicker on top of it we're building the biggest fiber optic ring that's ever been built in the history of our industry. It can hold up to 235,000 strands of fiber. It's all uh, buried very deeply. We're almost finished with our first Potomac River boring that's 91 feet below the bedrock of the river and uh, linking that up. And we're just 20 miles away from Equinix Ashburn, the center of the internet. So I think, I think we've really reached what our industry needs for uh, deployment of uh, infrastructures. They can go and deploy their data centers and serve the sector. Wow, amazing! And and I know that when we when we look forward to the this upcoming conference, you know, with Data Cloud USA, uh, there's a huge focus around sustainability. And can you talk about how what you're doing here ties into that, and and what you know what people will take away from this conference, and and what you may add to it? Absolutely. Uh, everybody has ESG goals. Uh, every single uh, cloud provider, every single enterprise. Uh, I, I actually had a call with a government entity this morning talking about the Department of Defense and Homeland Security and their sustainability goals. So it goes across the entire industry. But those sustainability goals are not just around your electrons or the energy serving you. They, everybody wants solar, they want wind, they want renewables, non-carbon sources of energy production, but they also want their data centers to be up and working. So it's it's not a flick a switch process to just turn everything on from a sustainable, sustainability perspective and use uh, non-carbon burning things. I think that's an eventuality. That's why everybody has targets of 2030 and 2040 and so on and so forth to reach those. So what we do um, it, from a sustainability perspective, we focus not just on those electrons, but we focus on land use, on water use, on material uses going into it and, and trying to use existing resources. So talk what I spoke about earlier with the campus being a former aluminum smelter, it's already zoned as industrial land. So we're not taking farmland and converting it. 
um, that might be producing food, it's already been used for industrial purposes. It, it's what's called a brownfield site by having industry on it that had pollution and other things in the past that then has been cleaned up and mitigated. We're reutilizing a brownfield site. That's incredibly sustainable. We're reutilizing existing transmission power lines. Those are the huge power lines that you see overhead when you're going down a highway or something like that, as big as they get. We have 230 kV lines already feeding our campus. So instead of putting in new ones, we're reutilizing existing lines that were literally dangling and had no more electricity on them anymore. So we're building a substation and pulling that in now. Um, we, we focus on green space on the campus. We have a bees and trees initiative. So our groundbreaking that we did uh, uh, just over a month ago, instead of putting a bunch of dirt and shovels in, we actually planted 50 trees. So a little bit different initiatives from the perspective of green space and open use. So it'll be almost a park-like environment around the data centers going there. And then from a water use perspective, that's tremendously important. So the, the reutilizing treated sewage water instead of drinking water for cooling is a very important thing for us. Um, and it goes down to the, the, the concrete next door to us is a, is a huge uh, mine that actually excavates the materials to create concrete. So we'll take those materials from that mine right next door to us and use that to produce the concrete that's serving the facilities on campus. It, it, so it's, it's truly from top of the stack all the way down to the bottom that we're, that we're putting this in place. Yeah, fully integrated uh, approach to sustainability Absolutely. from your perspective. Yeah, it's so great to hear that. And and I know that actually at the conference, you're actually speaking, uh, you're on the agenda to cover automation, mm -hmm. right? What, what do you plan to talk about there? So we're really excited about this. Um, when uh, Quantum Lupo as a company, we, we, we aren't massively staffed. We don't have hundreds of people. Our team are seasons, exec seasons executives who are executing a strategy of deployment to serve our customers. But again, we just play on land, energy, water, and fiber. So how do we succeed in that to support our clients? One of those things we're doing on the on the on the interconnection side, we're putting telesent robotic cross-connect machines to actually patch the fibers together. Now, that, that might sound like a novel idea, but, but what we're doing is actually at a scale to support eventually millions of strands of fibers interconnecting millions of square feet of data center space. If you try and do this from the beginning and do it in an automated fashion, you can create resilience for the clients in connecting. So a cross-connect physically might take you, once you order it in a data center, might take you 12 to 24 hours or sometimes up to a week to get put in place. And sometimes... They do an RXTX reversal or they don't proof it well and, and the con connection doesn't happen. Well, imagine if you now have to do 10,000 connections. One human being has to be at each end clicking that together and making sure it tests and works. If you use automated machines to do it, it can actually do the cross connect in two minutes. It'll test it before it connects it together and we can implement it very rapidly. So a thousand cross connects in theory could be 2000 minutes instead of hundreds and hundreds of hours and a lot of human labor to make all that happen. So that's just one example of automation we're doing and uh, we're excited about it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I, it feels like the industry's talked for some time about how automation may help operational efficiencies, but but it's sometimes slower to, to sort of take on some of these initiatives. What's your message to the industry in terms of how this can can help, what the, how they everyone can sort of reap the benefits of this? I, I think what I would always say is that, um, uh, you know, our, our industry is stodgy and, and it's not for the sake of, 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 you know, gray beards like me and being older and we're set in our ways. I think as an, it, when you really think about it, for, if you're an electrical engineer or an HVAC engineer or a telecom engineer, you, you, if it breaks, that buck, you know, the, the buck stops with you, right? You're the one who may have implemented that process. So, so from an engineering perspective, it's hard for engineers to take risk because risk represents the risk of failure. And if that fails, then your business fails, your customers fail and everything else. Um, so I think from an industry side, it's been a slow process to do those things. An example is moving away from generators. As an example, on the backup side, trusting uptime on the grid or new long duration battery technologies, things like that. Taking away uh, the warm blanket that a generator represents in your backup systems is hard to do. So. Um, you know, I would implore the industry to think at the scale of what we're thinking at gigawatts of power being deployed on a mass scale campus, take that opportunity to think out of the box and start really opening your eyes to uh, maybe technologies that create innovation around automation, around sustainability and, and around cost and helping them achieve those goals. So we, we, we work hand in hand with our customers to help those things out and hopefully we succeed. Hmm. 
you know, Josh, it's been, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you. I feel like there's so much more. You're just a plethora of information and insights. And I know we, we chatted a bit before about, um, you know, how you, you have shared some of that with the industry and, and how you're, you know, contributing to the overall, you know, learning and, and growth of our industry. And, and we really appreciate that. We appreciate the time with you here today, and hopefully we'll have lots more of it in the future. Uh, and so where can we send our viewers to learn more about Quantum Loophole? Uh, you can go to quantumloophole.com. Uh, that's our website to be able to look at things and, you know, certainly uh, attend Data Cloud. You'll hear me on panels and um, our CTO, Scott Nopum, will be there. You know, Scott built data centers for AboveNet, for Yahoo, and then for Apple. He's put billions and billions of dollars to work in the data center industry. So he's a great insight as well. So reach out to anybody on our team. We're happy to share what we're doing. Hop on a Google Earth a tour on Zoom and all kinds of fun stuff. And, you know, we're just providers helping to support the industry. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks again so much for joining us, uh, Josh, on this episode of JSA TV in preparation for D Data Cloud USA, which of course is coming up uh, in Austin in September, September 14th to 15th. Uh, we hope to see you all there and and good, good luck to you, Josh, with all your uh, speaking and networking that you'll be doing at that event. We look forward to seeing you there. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts. Happy networking. Mm -hmm.